Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. I'm Rob Black. Let's talk strategy today. I might mix in some current market headlines if they're hot, if they're sexy. But I think strategy is good to talk at least once a week. Let's talk about the mistakes people make. Um, Worst mistakes I see retirees make. And this is interesting because I'm not a CFP. I was registered investment advisor. I work with CFPs. I understand CFPs. I think that's the model that is most interesting to me. That does the most good of getting people to retirement and then through retirement. But retirement is supposed to be a rewarding chapter in your life, and I see people make mistakes. I have a weird job. People contact me and tell me what they have. Try that with your neighbor today. How much money do you have? And they're like, what, in my pocket? And you're like, no, how much are you worth? People don't like it. Um, Spending too much of their savings is obviously mistake number one. It's not uncommon for retirees to want to put some of their nest egg towards a major expense during the early years of retirement, like a vacation condo or a new RV. I think it can be a mistake for retirees to reason um, that, like, I I deserve this or it's a big ticket purchase time. You got plenty of time to spend it, but you don't have a lot of time to replenish it. Money needs to last a long time in retirement. Um, forgetting about tax consequences. This is one of the big reasons I work with a CFP. And I've talked with people in the last year at some of my pints and portfolios that I've put on great events. I hope to do one more, but not sure. And one of the biggest things that I see a man with 10 million plus dollars was that he had no tax strategy, none. And I'm like, That's where it gets complicated. That's where software that CFPs use helps. It's like finding cancer. You have to go to medical school to learn what it looks like, to put it under a a slide and microscope. You got to you got to learn this stuff. A few examples of money mistakes people can lead to tax consequences include selling stock to raise cash. That can trigger unintended tax liability. Make a, a traditional IRA individual retirement account withdrawal, which can move retirees into a tax bracket they prefer to stay below. The biggest mistake I see for retirees is kind of messing up their asset allocation all of a sudden. If a retiree's financial plan allows it and they're comfortable with the decision, it could be okay to move to mostly cash or mostly stocks. I get it. But there's consequences when you do that. And if you ever get a chance to sit down with CFP Chad Burton, he talks about asset location a lot in retirement. Sadly, another mistake that retirees tend to make all too often is financial scams. Um, <clears throat> I got an email yesterday from someone who was at American Funds. And I'm like, why were you at American Funds? He started his email by saying, I love the show. I listen to the show. And I'm like, why are you in American funds? They're average. ETFs and index funds are the way to go. Lower cost more often than not. And less commissions. And sadly, he was a teacher. And what happens is people would come into the school and say, hey, these American funds are great. Here, have a slice of pizza. And you're like, oh, free pizza. Chomp, 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 chomp. And you're telling me I should buy American funds? Chomp, chomp, chomp. Okay. Now he's being told to buy an annuity, an equity indexed annuity, probably the worst product on the planet for 99% of people, especially teachers. I would not put my enemy into an equity indexed annuity. And I say that with, I'm the kind of guy that not hunt and kill my enemies, but I have that mentality. So I see this mistake all too often. So that's some of the top mistakes that people make. Um, And I don't think an annuity is a financial scam. Let me be very clear about that. They have high costs and high fees. And you're basically buying insurance that your money's not going to run out. But if your money runs out, you lose. They don't work like they're supposed to. They're very complicated and very expensive. And they make the salesperson a big commission. 
it's not a surprise that I'm not going to say slimy salespeople, but salespeople go into schools with free food and try to woo teachers who aren't educated in finances to spend their retirement money allocations into such horrible product. 50% of Americans can't afford their lifestyle or retirement. That's brutal. Thinking about that, and I've talked about it all week. You typically pay less in taxes. You no longer have dependents to support. You've paid off your mortgage. Generally, you have fewer costs, and yet 50% of Americans can't afford their style of quality of life. In the 1970s and 1980s, defined benefit retirement plans moved to defined contributions. And pensions went bye-bye and in came 401ks. Let's talk about some stupid stuff that people buy. This took me just a couple minutes to write down like 20 things. Uh, Extended warranties. The only thing I buy an extended warranty on is ultimately a $1,400 phone. Things that can fall and break. Internet service providers that don't offer unlimited plans. That's still a thing. Annually replacing your smartphone. I'm now stretching my smartphone usage out. Well, not usage, but life uh, span. <clears throat> 95% of gym supplements. Aside from caffeine and creatine, none of them have been vetted enough to be called effective. So you're just taking pills to give yourself expensive urine. Huge weddings. Never understood people spending fifty to hundred thousand dollars in app purchases and games. That one drives me crazy because my kids are gamers. Uh, vacations to kid centered places with kids too young to appreciate them. Taking your kid to Disney when they're one or two years old, kind of like why? It's an expensive trip. They're not really able to appreciate it. One minute. Multiple streaming services. Um, I have a friend who literally gets a streaming service for a month or two, cancels it, gets a different one for a month or two, cancels it, gets a different one for a month. That's the way to do it. Drinking water out of a plastic bottle that you buy at 7-Eleven. Um, I have a canteen, uh, not a, like a military canteen, but like a, a thermos. And I can't tell you the last time I paid for bottled water. It's just such a waste of money. Um, yeah, so those are just a quick couple ones that come right off the, the tip of my mouth. Stop wasting money, people. You only live, you only work from 20 to 60, and then you live from 60 to 100. So 40 years of accumulating wealth, 40 years of managing wealth, and you're buying bottled water. Stop wasting money. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube at Rob Black Show. Brought to you by EP Wealth. This is the Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black, doing a little bit of a strategy show, and these shows are kind of all over the place, and all I ever want you to do is listen to the show for about 45 minutes a day, and I think you'll get something out of it. A story that made me really happy. Financially speaking, I'm a, a nerd, right? I work with CFPs, and they're very straight, and they're very perfectly cut pieces of material. I don't think it's that, that simple for most of us. But a surge in demand for lab-grown stones has weakened a key corner of the diamond market. This story made me happy. Diamond demand has softened since the pandemic, but the rough diamond market has seen sharp price drops. Prices for synthetic stones have seen bigger discounts as well. I love the idea of someone under the age of 35 basically saying, let's stop this silly, silly notion of a diamond ring. Keep in mind, I dropped a lot of money on my spouses. Um, and I don't know why. I think it's probably her expectations, not mine. The rising popularity of choosing lab-grown stones for engagement rings is cutting into the market for one of the world's most popular type of rough diamonds. While demand for diamonds and luxury goods at large has softened since the pandemic, the diamonds used in the lower price bridal rings have seen a sharp drop in prices. There's a company, the De Beers, 
they've had to slash prices by roughly 40% or rough diamonds between two to four carats that can be furnished in bridal rings that are high quality, but not perfect. Last June, De Beers charged about 1400 a carat for select marketable cuts. This year, by halfway through the year, that fell to about $850 a carat. Now, again, what I really, really like is young people want to remember the day forever. You don't have to pay for the day forever. So when I see $50,000 to $100,000 weddings, I'm like, that's too much. No more, in my opinion, than ten to 15000 And that's a lot for me. I eloped. Got married in a field in Lake Tahoe. Uh, we go to that field probably every year. Um, we had a dog with us who served as a ring bear. And I think I'm just as married as you are. But I didn't have to have 300 witnesses. Now, again, I overspent on the, the ring and I overspent on the party that we had for family when we came back. Synthetic stones are taking a bigger share of the diamond market. In India, where most of the world's supply is cut and polished, synthetic stones make up 9% of the diamond exports in June. Lab-grown stones are faster made, cheaper, and more environmentally friendly than mining a diamond. They're not a new threat to the industry, but the demand's picking up. And I love seeing that story. The diamond mining industry is not a good one and has a bad history. I don't want to compare it to other industries because I, I don't want to get canceled. I don't want to say something that's that's so provocative that you go, oh, I'm upset by that because my, my spouse has a diamond on her hand. I'm like, yeah. Getting that diamond out of the ground costs people some lives in more ways than just the heartbeat. Southwest Airlines is having multiple pilot problems. I fly Southwest a lot. I don't care how I get from point A to point B. The only time I'll ever fly first class is if I use points and if it's a trip of six hours or more. I won't fly first class uh, unless I'm going to Europe or going to Hawaii. And then it's with points. I know. I know you're saying, okay, you're getting a little preachy there, Rob. Back to Southwest. Um, Southwest pilots are well paid and they're getting a roughly a 40% increase. Very similar to what United Delta and American Airlines are getting. Unions have been a big winners in 2023. As the economy recovers, a lot of people are unhappy. They don't want to go to work. They don't want to work for too many hours. And unions are stepping in saying, we can help you negotiate. The estimated pay for a pilot right now is about 118000 almost 119000 for a Southwest pilot. They're getting a bump up to 163000 I think that's great. Again, but here's the problem. I know I'm going to be paying more for my Southwest flights. And that's I think that's fine, too. Here's where it stinks. It's going to be more expensive for you, too. 215 pilots of Southwest have left this year. Compare that with 571 that have left since 1971. They're having a big turnover of experienced pilots at Southwest. I don't know how that makes me feel, but it's not great. I know you're saying, I can pick it up, but you put it down. There is a company, Goldman Sachs has recently said, we're probably not going to go into a recession. After earlier this year saying, we probably are going into a recession. And one of the things that they do is they also publish research to help you learn a little bit more. Well, no, they publish research for their brokers to use for their clients. But people like me, who get access to all sorts of research. I pay easily $2,000 a month for information. Um, and I was reading through the Goldman Sachs. They came up with a list of six global stocks that'll do well 
it came up with a list of six Google stocks that'll do well in a slowing environment. And the first one jumped out at me as that's kind of interesting. Mercedes Benz. It's only listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. Not that difficult for you to get onto, but you're not going to get on it through a Robinhood account. Its big theme is electric vehicles for Mercedes Benz. Now, 30 seconds. We're talking about finely engineered vehicles, and Mercedes goes head to head against Audi and BMW. But they're upping their game. They're aiming to turn out some even more luxurious models that'll place it amongst the Porsche crowd. A little bit more premium. We'll talk about this and the other five stocks that Goldman Sachs has a list that will do well in a down market or a slowing economy. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. Visit the Rob Black Show online at robblackshow.com. Listen to archived podcasts, market updates, and information from EP Wealth's certified financial planners online at robblackshow.com. Thanks for listening. When we last left off, I was talking a little bit about Goldman Sachs having a list. Now, again, they don't know you. So taking advice from a list is really, really silly. When they're publishing information like this and they're getting on CNBC and Bloomberg, they're trying to say, look, we're smart. We know that earlier this year we said that the stock market and the economy were going into a recession. Watch out. They've since updated their information. And they came out with a list of stocks that will do well, in their opinion, no matter what. I think it's a little crazy to say out loud, but we're talking about Mercedes-Benz that's traded on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange and how the company is trying to focus away from producing compact cars and trying to prioritize sales of its highest-end vehicles like the class S-Class. It generates better cash flow on a cumulative basis. With the auto industry undergoing a huge green transition, Goldman believes Mercedes' focus on luxury and electrification and ultimately, he's going to help the company maintain its high profit margin. Just throwing it down there. Another stock on the list that I go, okay, okay. Again, you have to have a, you have to work with a broker that has access to international markets. This one is on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. And it's a company called Daikin. It's a best in class Japanese air conditioning manufacturer. And it's grown a big franchise in the United States. Japanese stocks are in vogue. Warren Buffett just bought a bunch of them. There's a lot of value. You hear about the Apple and the Microsoft and the Amazon, Tesla, Google, and you hear about their high valuations. Not so much in Japan. This makes me think of this 19, what was it? 90 song, Alphaville. When you're big in Japan, tonight, big in Japan. <clears throat> I know you're saying Alphaville. Really, Rob? Yesterday, you admitted to Bonnie Tyler. Now you're admitting to Alphaville? Yes. Don't pick on me. But Japanese stocks do offer something. Again, It's they're not widely followed in the United States. So Daikin Industries is doing energy-efficient heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. What was the story of the summer of 2023? It's hot. What else happened in 2022? Joe Biden's plan to put more energy efficiency into Americans' homes by offering discounts. A friend of mine says, I'm getting an air conditioner. I'm like, no, you're going to get a, a heat pump. And I said, you get a big federal credit for it. And he's like, well, tell me about this. And heat pumps are awesome. Um, it's become hotter in Lake Tahoe area. And of course, all homes have heaters there. But now you get a heat pump and you have a heater and an air conditioner. And it's more energy efficient than an air conditioner. And what's going to happen in the United States? What did we see? Phoenix have some crazy record this year for days above 110 degrees. 30 days in a row. I'm making that up, but it was something like that. You think there's a home in Phoenix that doesn't have an air conditioner? Or how about Texas? 
and the area that I live in is considered temperate. It's considered Mediterranean and you need it. It's, 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 it gets hot now. So people could save more energy with Daikin systems because it can change how fast it works depending on the temperature. Energy efficiency is being sharpened as far as a strategy goes. And they're in a position to grab market share. Taiwan Semiconductor is on the list of six stocks that Goldman Sachs sees as possible plays in a slowing economy. That they're, they're not, their demand's not going to go away. This one's interesting because this one you can get. You don't need a lot of introduction to semiconductors. You know what they do. They're growing a wave of stronger demand for silicon. The company holds 60% of the global semiconductor foundry market. 60%. There is no NVIDIA if there's not a Taiwan semiconductor. They're in demand fueling the latest AI advancements and the EV rise. To me, it's no surprise that Taiwan Semi, the world leader in advanced semiconductor chips productions, should be a beneficiary on multiple themes. Right now, GPUs are special tools that can process many pieces of data simultaneously, making them useful for machine learning, video editing, gaming applications, virtual reality, self-driving cars. Goldman believes Taiwan Semi can grow sales by 27% in 2024 and 19% in 2025. And surprisingly, it's not way overpriced. Now, here's the first one that Goldman Sachs has thrown down that I'm like, I did not think of that as a play that would be on a list that's good for slow and world economies. And it's just, it's funny. It's Philip Morris. So Altria is the cigarette division. The two companies split apart. They made an international division and they made a U.S. division. The U.S. division has a, a fluffy, flowery name, Altria. Not my thing. I think domestic smoking is, is on the... It's pricey. And fewer and fewer people are doing it. And there's too many options now, like vaping. I'm not a smoker. My dad died of cancer. So for me to talk about Philip Morris, it's a weird thing. But Philip Morris is the international side of tobacco. They've been laser focused on performing and perfecting a range of smoke-free tobacco products that are not only more advanced and diverse, but also gaining popularity faster than their competitors. The company reported a whopping 1.4 million new users of their IQOS system. Its flagship brand of heated tobacco devices. This number exceeded its previous pace of around a million new users and implies that the company is making big market share gains. It boasts significantly higher average gross margins compared to traditional cigarettes. So they figured out a way to get tobacco in people's bodies that makes more money than the traditional cigarettes. That's fascinating to me. Philip Morris is gearing up for an aggressive move. They're reintroducing the system in the United States, the world's biggest and most profitable nicotine market. One of the first uh, Disney cartoons I ever saw scared the pee out of me. It was one of the ones that were like hallucinatory. And it was all about how bad tobacco is. And I think maybe it was Mickey Mouse was going through like a haunted house. And there was a bad guy named Nick O'Teen. <laughs> We know it's bad. Even Disney can make it look bad. And yet in Americans, we're like, we need nicotine. That's why you kind of got to love it. But again, the international side is the more appropriate play. Uh, good income, really good income stock. But you have to deal with people smoking and dying of cancer. Oh, I heard a weird one this week. I was watching a little CNBC um, at lunchtime. And there was an interview with a company that makes drones and the host was talking to the CEO of the company and she's like, okay, so this new drone, the X1 1517, um, what's its killing capacity? And it's, it's weird to see a beautiful woman, a smart, well-polished, beautiful woman talking about investing in a company 
that has equipment that kills people. Now, I know that Boeing makes missiles and I know that, you know, people will own Boeing and they're like, oh, it's the airplane company. But they also make missiles. I'm, it's not lost. I mean, they also do drones. Um, so it's a little freaky. For, I, I, like Lockheed Martin seems like a military competent. Boeing doesn't. But when you're interviewing someone, and you're talking like, oh, so this is being used to kill Russians right now. What makes it different than strapping a grenade on to, a, you know, a backyard drone? And the guy's like, oh, blah, 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 blah. It was just weird. And again, you have to get over what you're investing in. Do you want to invest socially conscious or not? I, I don't have an opinion for you. I do see Philip Morris as a smart stock to put on the list like this. One thing that we Americans export, and I always love saying this phrase because it makes me sound like just the biggest jerk. Uh, we export cancer. Like, we're pretty good at, at sending things that will kill you to other countries and then using it to take a little stress out of their body after a long days of work. Here's another one. This one's on the NYSE. It's called Darling Ingredients. It's a renewable diesel manufacturer, and it's looking at a huge opportunity in the eco-friendly aviation fuel. Um, it's part of the Inflation Reduction Act and decarbonization. The company transforms used cooking oil and animal byproducts into eco-friendly biofuel. It's got a 50-50 joint venture called Diamond Green Diesel. Goldman believes that the strategy positions darling ingredients for long-term success. Thanks to the increasing demand for waste fats and oils in the renewable diesel industry. Goldman, when I saw this list, I'm like, I need to learn more about darling ingredients. Because of Inflation Reduction Act and decarbonization and renewable diesel manufacturer. I get it. And I, I'm going to look at it. Then there's one that really fascinates me. And it's OCI. It's an agricultural company. Not a sexy name. It's a fertilizer manufacturing that offers dividend yield and exposure to clean energy, hydrogen and clean ammonia. We need fertilizer. Otherwise, we don't have food. Period. What do we need to live? Food. You can find me online at robblackshow.com. You are listening to the Rob Black Show podcast. For more information on EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com. I'm Rob Black. Thanks for listening to the show. Apple's getting ready to launch new phones in seven days, and it used to be a thing where Americans would lose their mind and like, let's let's see the new phone. Let's see the new phone. And then when the new phone comes out three or four days later, there's a line at the Apple stores. Can't imagine anyone waiting to line anymore. But those were fun days to remember. Apple's had a run into problems recently. With China and the Chinese government's basically retaliating against the U.S. government. Many U.S. states have banned TikTok on phones of state officials. Some colleges have banned TikTok. Um, it's not hard to imagine spyware being put into or Trojan horse traps being put into software to spy. And again, if China learns that our children spend X amount of dollars and spend this much time uh, that information can be used against us. And how can it be used against you? Like I've seen commercials or uh, videos on TikTok that tell people don't go to college. It's a waste of money. And there, there's some truth to that. If you're going to be a history major or a poetry major, and I'm not taking a knock at the liberal arts. I'm just saying it's a lot of money that you're not going to recoup more than likely as a history teacher. Now, we need history teachers, so this is a dilemma. But I see that as poisoning my children. And I, I can see the algorithm kicking out, hey, let's do every four videos going to be an anti-U.S. education theme. So Apple is retaliating against the United States for banning TikTok in some states by saying their government officials, not only on national level, but on their state levels, um, are banned from using the watches, the AirPods, and the phones. Now, the opportunity to sell devices in China is big. 
China is a big headache right now for Tim Cook, but he's also starting to address like getting the phones built in other areas like India, another growth market that Apple hasn't really captured. Now, is this overblown or not? Apple stock fell by $107 billion in two days. Now it's almost $200 billion. But if you look at it, it's exactly where it was 12, 13 days ago. So it's not like the tide's coming out right now, but it just had come in too. Apple is an expensive stock. I own shares of Apple. And I can tell you, I expect nothing from Apple other than to continue generating cash flow and buying back shares. And until they get something to move the needle, which I think will be the I, the watch, the next, not this one, not the nine, but the 10. I think the 10 is going to have some um, diabetes types of blood sugar levels, readings, uh, or blood pressure. Either one of those would be game changing. Huge. Apple's market shares jumped by roughly 300 basis points over the past 18 months. Apple plans to highlight the new phones. Wait, wait, what did I say? I see, that's right. Apple's market shares jumped by 3%. Um, 15 years ago, going to the gym, when I would look at the uh, other people in the gym who are in better shape than me and better looking than me, and I would wantingly go, wow, he's good looking. Wow, she's good looking. They all had Apple products. It is a luxury item in the United States. It's not quite Louis Vuitton, Moe, Hennessy, but it's the same vein. And they basically say, look at me. You want to marry me because I'm successful. I think it's a, and that's why they're going to have to be very, very careful with their augmented glasses, Vision Pro, because they're not attractive. They don't say how great you are. They say, look how alone I am. I'm doing this experience in the world of, by myself. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. So it's a lot of money to think about the market cap that Apple's lost. But in the last 18 months, they've picked up three percentage points on Samsung and Google phones. Just throwing that down there for you. This time last year, Apple couldn't get China to make enough phones because they were having still shutdown problems in China. They would have sold more pros. They didn't have enough to sell. So people would eventually would say, you know what? I'm just going to get the regular phone. This year, that's not going to be the problem. And they're going to sell a lot of them at high margins. So just telling you how I think. Freddie Mercury memorabilia is drawing enthusiastic crowd at Sotheby's. You know that video where he wears, he looks like he dresses up like royalty and has a crown? That crown's for sale. I think that would be pretty cool to own, but I'm not going to buy it. I, I refer to things that you buy at auction as exquisite clutter. <laughs> I'm like, nope. Um, not from me. The first item, a graffiti covered door on which fans had written tributes, prompted a spontaneous chant of We Will Rock You, sold for $521,000. Wow. Some of his costumes sold for $800,000. The scarlet cloak and crown that he wore, $256,000. Stylish man. I ain't paying that much for um, exquisite clutter. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, or guess X Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black. Take care. For more information about EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com.